This is such a, I feel, speaking of things that maybe I shouldn't even bring into the discussion, but it just brought up this pop culture thing, right? I was thinking of uh, that TV show, The Wire, right? Which is obviously mm-hmm. a very popular show for a variety of reasons. And But there's a season where you follow this mayoral candidate in Baltimore and he's like progressive and he's like, I'm going to like make policing better and whatever, you know, we're going to. We're going to, I don't know, he had this whole thing that he wanted to do and he had all these ambitions and promises he made as a mayor and he gets into office and as soon as he gets in, he realizes there's this huge budget like issue, right? Like they're, they have this enormous amount of debt or something. It was like something like that. So all the promises he had about policing were like, he couldn't do them and he had to make certain political decisions of what he was going to prioritize over others. And it had nothing to do with what was the right thing for the city, it had nothing to do with any of the promises he made. He had to make very cynical political calculations. So I think what I'm just trying to say here is that was a really good, I think, as far as a TV show goes, a demonstration of that. But I think, <laughs> but it just came to my mind because I was thinking about that. I'm like, you know, like, obviously, I'm not here to provide any sympathy for politicians or anything, but I do understand that structurally, these things are built in a very particular way where you can't seemingly as a sheriff or the city council or, you know, whatever you, you're going to have all these obstacles in the way of actually decarcerating or like moving away from this model. Right. So, I mean, this is kind of where I think carceral humanism comes in where it's like, well, if we can't actually provide those services, we might as well provide them through the local jail. Right. And that's what's kind yeah. of that's messed up about the whole situation is like we shouldn't have to incarcerate people to provide health care, you know, or to get them off the street where they're freezing to death. It doesn't make it's not even just about lack of imagination. It's like there's an, there's an imagination there, I imagine, but it's being used in this way where it's like kind of confined to quite literally the jail or the prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I imagine that when sheriffs, which have this incredible power in these counties, use this logic Right. It's like, well, I do care about my citizens. I do care about the people in this county. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to do it in this very specific way that doesn't really upset the status quo because I can't, right? So um yeah, yeah it seems to be the seems to be the lay of the land, from what I can tell. Yeah, and I and I wanna say, and I'm apologies, you asked this question a bit ago and I didn't yeah, actually not so good. Part of it. I just totally breathed by. Um, you know, cursory humanism I think is such an important concept. And you know, we should say, right, this um, was first kind of coined by James Kilgore, who was a great chapter in the book, who I think really is able to kind of walk us through these dynamics really well, um, where there's both kind of, you know, um, and I think he does this great job in talking through the specific campaign that he was a part of in, Mm -hmm. um, oh no, is it Champaign or is it Urbana? I can't remember which county it is. Is it Champaign? Champaign. Champaign, Champaign. yes. Right, where there was a fight to kind of expand the jail there. And it was initially a tough on crime kind of orientation, mm-hmm. right? We got to lock people up, um, you know, got it. There's too much crime on the streets and so on and so forth. And then, right, this gets defeated. And there's this kind of remaking of this story, right? And I, because um, people want to be good liberals, right? They want to kind of figure out how to repackage these things um, to these stories. And I want to say this very clearly. I think sometimes this is the story, right? There is a kind of real um, political populace happening, right? Um, There is a co-optation of people's concern for um, the conditions people are living under while they're incarcerated. Um, And then there's also um, the people who I think are being cynical about it. And also there are people who their limited imagination of where you can do things is so confined because of decades of these kinds of policies mm. that the only place you could imagine something like um, support for people who are struggling with addiction, like people who have mental health supports, is the jail. And so you end up with this story that the jail is a site of care when we know that jails are actually um, you know, sites of incredible kind of high rates of premature death. Um, they have so many kind of harms that are fundamental to them. And there is this way that um, it also works to pit folks against each other. So mm-hmm. there are stories of campaigns um, where on one hand, you have folks who are saying, I care about the jail. Um, this happened in New York City with Rikers um, and the mm-hmm. kind of fights around this Rikers um, kind of borough-based jail plan, right? There became fights around folks saying, well, we need to close Rikers and we need to really care about people's needs. And this is how we're going to do it. Like who wants to say that like 
this isn't the kind of solution. Um, and then it picks people who say, well, people, there is no care inside of a jail at all, right? So it also, I think, works to fracture folks mm. um, who might even have um, similar politics on a number of things, might have similar experiences of being criminalized or incarcerated themselves right but it becomes this kind of offer that i think is really compelling um for folks who are trying to figure out well okay there have to be jails what kind of jails might we imagine right <laughs> versus actually getting to the point of saying we don't want any jails at all and i think that this has been really insidious and mm. you know really showing up across the country especially as jack said a little bit ago in more kind of liberal leaning areas um, where people want to think of themselves as against mass incarceration, even as they're kind of organizing to expand incarceration at the exact same time and trying to mm -hmm. pretend that's not what they're doing. Yeah, I think that this is going to really point to my last maybe question or set of questions here, which is really just about, you know, the various fights that are happening around the U.S. to counter the expansion or the building of jails and how... Yeah, I mean, like, what are some of the pitfalls of that? What are some of the ways in which there have been obvious success stories? What are the some of the ones where um, things get sidetracked or you actually end up doing the very thing that you may have been campaigning against, right? Or you might have people who supported, you know, the campaign and then end up supporting the, you know, basically the county's plan to expand a jail. You know what I mean? Like, what are some of the things that on the ground that we have seen that have been documented in the book or elsewhere that really show how, uh, you know, show success stories, but also show those pitfalls as well that can come along. Jack has uh, insights into that. Uh, all right, I'll go. I thought Lydia was on a roll. I don't, I'm like, I'm <laughs> reluctant to just like single out certain stories. Okay. Um, in terms, I, I do, yeah, we've seen a lot of like, this is where I'm like, please read the book. Please get this book and read the book <laughs> because um, even if you've been like annoyed at like how rambly and wonky we are, <laughs> Sorry, Lydia. Um, it's like in me. Um, there are a lot of good chapters written by people who have been involved in anti-jail fights. Mm -hmm. And, um, and mm -hmm. a lot of really, uh, I think, beautiful and some really amazing analysis of like the county or city level from people who have been involved in that. Um, so there's that. That's my plug for the book. Um, in terms of like what I think about anti-jail fights not being involved in any specifically right now, but it's like that the anti-jail fight, I think um, we write in the conclusion of this book, and I think this is Lydia that brought this up in the conclusion, it's like they're iterative. And, you know, we see that in the chapters, like often it's like you're going to have to fight them over and over and over again, because like yeah. even when people win a round, you know, like the, the, the forces that are pushing the jail, the forces that are pushing incarceration are organized and they may, they almost definitely will come back with a, Sort of tweaked plan or a totally different plan or they might come at you from like the sort of uh, a radical liberal perspective mm. or, or whatever so like they're, they're going to be iterative and um yeah that we know um i think from what i've seen in like rural the rural united states you know like anti-jail fights can be dangerous and frightening as well you know i mean mm. i don't know i'm from a rural area you know it's like if you're if you're in a political fight, um, you know, the cops can show up at your house. Um, everybody knows who you are, that sort of thing. So I don't know why I'm bringing that up. I just think it's an important, it's an important thing to bring up because I've, I've seen a lot of like anti-jail fights in rural counties and I'm just sort of, um, I really look up to the people uh, that, that go out there and fight jail expansion plans. And, and what I've seen a lot, and in, in, especially in rural areas is like, um, those anti-jail fights and they have to be about all all sorts of things i mean they mm -hmm. might not start out that way but they're going to end up being um mm -hmm. about the sort of contradictions of capital uh yeah. that we're dealing with in a certain area and and um that organized abandonment that we talked about and that's generally where it goes so lydia do you have any any good stories well, you know, I think that one of the stories that I think is worth saying, I know I told the story of, you know, this terrible judge situation in New Orleans, but I do think it's worth also noting, right, there was a really extensive campaign for a good five or six years after Katrina around the jail. Um, and the campaign um, by these folks of the Orleans Parish Prison Reform Coalition, which was truly a coalition, right? It wasn't just one of those things that called themselves a coalition, like there were dozens of organizations mm -hmm. involved. 
some doing immigrant justice work, um, some people doing stuff around criminal justice, some people related to questions of mental health. Um, some folks in the room were like more kind of wonky prison reformers. Some people were more prison abolitionists who were going to throw bricks at people, not literally, but figuratively. That's their words, <laughs> not mine. Um, and all of these kind of different folks in between who really took on, and I think this is really important, both the ideological and the economic kind of structures, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I really appreciate in that story of their organizing against the jail, specifically when the sheriff tried to expand it out after um, much of it was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina, and there was a bunch of FEMA money. So there was basically a check from FEMA for uh, $270 million for rebuilding the jail, which the sheriff said should be used to expand the jail. Mm. And there are kind of two key things um, that I want to highlight. One is which they did not just argue against the sheriff's move, which was to add a couple thousand new beds to the jail. It wasn't just a no, don't expand it more. They said, no, it should be shrunk actually even smaller than it already is, right? So they started mm. from a point that was not, you know, uh, and there was a whole kind of debate around if it should be zero beds versus a cap. Uh, people politically had lined around a cap um, of 850 beds versus the like 4,000 beds the sheriff was trying to build the jail back up to. Mm. And I find this to be a really powerful story, right? Because they could have just gone to the council on the defensive position and said, no, don't expand the jail, right? And so they said, should the jail should be shrunk down even further um, and really made this big case um, that they should be moving in a kind of opposite direction, not just holding kind of the status quo. Mm -hmm. So when there was eventually a kind of compromise, which was, you know, less than ideal, um, uh, 1,468 beds, it was already thousands of beds less than the sheriff said, right? And it was actually mm -hmm. thousands of beds less than the jail already was, right? And they mm -hmm. saw this as a kind of first line of struggle so that they were kind of unwilling to compromise in that kind of moment um, so that they could kind of, you know, get the best that they could get under those particular political moments. Mm -hmm. The other thing is they really built out a campaign that helped people see that the expanded jail was in basically no one's interest in the city of New Orleans. So like deep levels of teach-ins with the neighborhood association where the jail was headquarters, where it was placed, um, the Mid-City Neighborhood Association saying, you know, you guys should come out against this jail, not because of a kind of racist narrative of like, you don't want, you know, criminals in your neighborhood, right? But an understanding that a jail doesn't benefit anyone and the folks in that jail are also your neighbors, right? And so there's another way of thinking about this question. Um, also getting really nitty gritty on the per diem system, right? That's how I first learned about it when this campaign mm -hmm. was happening mm -hmm. back in like 2009, 2010. Um, and getting really clear about these mechanisms that are indeed, as Jack keeps saying, wonky, right? But become the kind of terrain that folks have to get really specific on as they mm. are fighting counsel, as they are fighting reports. Um, and then kind of challenging a narrative that what was best um, for a city was to lock more people up, right? So really pushing back against, mm. again, tough, tough on crime articulations, but also these carceral humanist articulations that you increasingly started to shape this narrative, right? right. So mm -hmm. um, that, I think, is really key, thinking about all those different pieces there. Right. Yeah, they, they, it's really wonky because, again, I was going to reiterate, like, the jail stuff is like, it's fighting over planning and development, which <laughs> is a wonky way of saying it. it's like fighting over what the future looks like. But like, mm -hmm. um, that's why it's wonky. I mean, it, it's like, right. it's, but it's not just a budget fight. So it's like, but I think it's important to keep in mind, or it's just necessary to keep that in mind when fighting a jail. Um, I mean, even at the level of like, because rural counties are now using like ARPA funds, like American Rescue Plan funds, um, mm -hmm. like the infrastructure bill mm -hmm. to build to build jails, right? Mm -hmm. It's being, at, at a fundamental level, it's being framed like the police, Cop City, I, I don't know if they're framing Cop City this way, but it's like, I see this, these carceral infrastructures are real infrastructures like like roads are right roads allow you to get from one place to another to go to your job it like it creates a certain uh yeah possibilities in the world and all that and it's like that's what this stuff is it's, it's infrastructures that create certain futures um and they're they're using the same sort of bonds that they would use to build other sorts of public infrastructure like that so um whatever i i go on and on and on about this but it's like i just think it's important for people to understand it's just like this stuff is wonky this stuff is really basic and it's like instead of building you a school or a road or whatever they're like building a place to lock you and your friends and your family up in mm 